Uh, hello, and this is Jim Knights. This is my, uh, as you can see, my website address, jjknights.com, and my email address is jjknights at jjknights.com. If you try to contact me or find the website, please remember my name has an S on the end. It's a little unusual. Um, some people drop that when they're writing or, or speaking, so jjknights.com. And the title of this uh, presentation is Distaff Soldiers During the Civil War. Female soldiers who fought as men are often referred to as distaff soldiers. Distaff means of or having to do with women. The word derives from the spindle of a spinning wheel. On the left, we have Elizabeth Quinn, also known as Frank Miller of Company G, the 90th Illinois Infantry, which was Chicago's Irish Regiment. This is from 1864. This image of her is from a book cover, which I purloined from Shelby Harriel who wrote Behind the Rifle, Women Soldiers in the Civil War, Mississippi. Uh, Shelby and I uh, were signing books last year at the Conference of the Society of Women and the Civil War. And I got a copy of her book and she got a copy of mine. All right. I'll talk more about Elizabeth Quinn later. Those of you who were, uh, who were present for my last lecture uh, on Canadians in the Civil War will remember Sarah Emma Edmonds of Makadavik, New Brunswick. Um, Sarah is the, uh, the unifying or the, the, the nexus between the two uh, um, topics, Canadians in the Civil War and distaff soldiers. She was the only woman from north of the 49th parallel who came south disguised as a man and fought in the war. The photo on the left is uh, pre-war when she was a Bible salesman in Michigan. The one on the right is from about 1885, and she was the inspiration for my historic, uh, historical novel, Soldier Girl Blue. Edmonds was one of at least 550 women that we know of, both Union and Confederate, who disguised themselves as men in order to fight in the war. Significantly, Edmonds is the only Canadian distaff soldier we know of. She's also the best known because she wrote a wartime memoir. That was extremely unusual because in Victorian America, a woman posing as a man was not only illegal, it was considered quite shameful. Consequently, the vast majority of distaff soldiers never spoke about having disguised themselves as men. We'll, get, uh, we'll talk more about Sarah Emma Edmonds a little bit later. And here uh, was a very nice couple I met at Mill Creek, uh, Mill Springs, Kentucky back in October during a reenactment. That's uh, Mary Todd on the left, and you may recognize Abraham on the right. They liked my book. Actually, you may recognize these, uh, uh, this couple, Tom and Sue Wright of Tennessee. He's a well-known Abraham Lincoln impersonator. They're both, they're both well-known impersonators. So how many distaff soldiers were there? Well, that we can verify 400 to 550, but according to Shelby Harriel, possibly thousands more. Documentation was not the best back then. In the Victorian era, posing as a man was illegal, as I said. Um, how they were treated would, if they were caught was inconsistent. Uh, in the North, they were almost certainly discharged, although there were a couple of cases where they were allowed to remain in. Often they were jailed, but in the South, they were placed in Castle Thunder with the, uh, with the Yankee spies and uh, the deserters and the homosexuals. They were treated very badly by their own people in the South. They had to be discreet. Uh, they didn't like to brag. So uh, again, it was considered shameful to staff soldiers and their families kept mun. And uh, they lied to reporters who were notoriously inaccurate anyway. But this means something. And what this means is that every, every single woman who came into the army on either side was a willing volunteer, unlike many men uh, who were drafted or uh, succumbed to peer pressure. Every woman who fought wanted to be there. Neither the USA nor the CSA expected or desired their military service. It's important to remember that women were under no social or cultural obligation to defend their country, other than what they could do on the home front. And here we have a cartoon uh, from the era of a man dressing as a woman to escape service while women were dressing as men to get into the service. Here we have a, uh, a wife uh, explaining to her husband that either he goes or she goes. And there were a few documented cases of women making that threat. And lastly, we have a, a man proudly boasting to his girlfriend that, or wife that 
he found a substitute and she replies, well, she found a substitute for him. These cartoons tie together the themes of distaffed soldiers and the social pressure to enlist faced by men. Whereas men face public disapproval if they failed to enlist, women face public disapproval if they did. Though predominantly or prominently used during World War I, since the 18th century, the white feather was a symbol of cowardice. Sarah Emma Edmonds does refer to her, it in her novel or in her, her memoir. There were, uh, going back to World War I, there were a couple of cases where this backfired on the young women who were roaming the streets, handing these out to military aged men in civilian clothes. One, uh, one young woman gave the feather to a man in civilian clothes who was simply on leave. He was on a streetcar with her um, after he expressed his disapproval and explained himself to her. The other passengers on, on the car escorted her off. On another occasion, um, a young man in civilian clothes was on his way to a testimonial dinner in London because he had been awarded the Victoria Cross. He, uh, being enlisted, they asked him to come in uh, civilian clothes. He was given a feather by a young woman and an unpleasant altercation ensued after that. So, Victorian social mores restricted women. They could be teachers, governesses, writers, seamstresses, factory workers where they earned less than men. They could, of course, go into domestic service where they earned uh, only part of what a farmhand would, uh, would earn. And of course, there was always prostitution. Whereas men, of course, had no such gender-based restrictions. So why did they join the military? If you saw my presentation on Canadians in the war, Canadians joined the, the uh, US Army or Confederate Army for the same reason that uh, Americans did. And the same is true for women. They joined for the same reasons as men. They wanted to follow a loved one or a friend to get away from home. Uh, they were stirred by patriotism or martial passion. They, want to, they were seeking adventure, the revenge, vengeance. They wanted the money. They wanted an improved social economic uh, situation. <clears throat> And eventually they became attached to the comrades and stayed for that reason. But for women, the only sociable, socially acceptable reasons to be in the army in the guise of a man were following a loved one or patriotism. Any other motivation was considered demoralizing, which was different, meant different things than it did today. Demoralized meant to undermine morality. It was a euphemism for prostitution. Well, what about prostitution? In a letter from uh, Private Henry Schelling, Company F of the 64th Illinois Infantry to his wife, we enlisted a new recruit on the way to East Port. The boys all took a notion to him. The recruit was, of course, sub subsequently found to be a woman in discharge. And he writes, I was sorry for it, for I wanted him for a bedfellow. He put this in a letter to his wife. Six women used the military to escape prostitution. Four women were accused without substantiation. One engaged in prostitution after she left, and these are distaff soldiers, and only one woman actually engaged in prostitution while in the army. So it's clear prostitution was not a motive. What about being crazy? That was another uh, yeah. accusation. Well, these are the four cases. The insanity theory doesn't hold up. These four cases are the only ones known Coincidentally, regarding the last case, which occurred in April 1863, this is also when Sarah Emma Edmonds was forced by malaria to escape the army and seek refuge at an Oberlin, Ohio boarding house and was, as Frank Thompson subsequently declared, a deserter. But these are the only four cases of um, unbalanced behavior we know of that are documented. What did a woman posing as a man gain? And this is really, in general, not just for distaff soldiers. They gained economic privilege, social opportunity, male power. Men could do anything. They gained their independence. It was certainly safer to travel as a man than as a woman. And they had full status as citizens, including voting. Women could vote disguised as men, and they did. A private in the Union Army earned $13 a month, which is about $312 today, plus the bounty. Um, this is significantly more than a woman could earn, and that was increased to $16 a month later on in 1864. So how did somebody get the same idea? 
Well, they were inspired by the distaff soldiers of the Revolution, the War of 1812, and the Mexican-American War. These cases of distaff soldiers were well known in the mid 19th century. Real and fictional distaff soldiers and sailors celebrated in novels, ballads, and poetry. Allegedly, there was a distaff U.S. Marine on the USS Constitution during the War of 1812. During the Mexican War, General Zachary Taylor, who later became president, of course, unknowingly recruited two distaff soldiers, one of whom became the Army's first female colonel. There are also European examples, including Catalina de Arraso, who escaped from a Spanish convent in the 1600s and went to South America as a conquistador. She later confessed or told the story of what she had done in her uh, later years and was nicknamed the Nun Lieutenant. However, it's important to remember that more female soldiers in the Civil War fought more than in any previous war. There are more female soldiers in the Civil War than any previous war in our country's history. In her book, uh, Warrior Women and, and Popular Balladry, Diane Duga explains the female warrior motif as a cross-dressing heroine, as a model of beauty and pluck, deserving in romance, able in war, and rewarded in both. It was a very popular uh, literary motif during the 19th century. At this point, uh, I'd like to just add one thing. There is no evidence of these distaff soldiers being transgender which is being espoused by some contemporary writers. These women are now all dead and cannot explain or defend their actions. It's a mistake, I think, and very unfair to judge a mid 19th century phenomenon by 21st century standards and sensibilities. As far as we can know, especially from the memoir of Sarah Emma Edmonds, these women had to pretend to be men in order to achieve a goal, be it fulfilling their patriotic duty, gaining independence or whatever. To our knowledge, all but one reverted to their female personas after their military service, and we'll talk about that one a little bit later on. This novel was given to Sarah Emmett, Emmett's by, uh, by an itinerant peddler who spent the night at her family's farm when she was about nine years old. It was undoubtedly the first novel she had ever seen, which must have magnified the impression it made on her, and ironically, she was a British subject who was inspired by a tale of the American Revolution. Her biographer, Sylvia Dannett, in her 1960 book, she wrote with the generals, pleased that this is the uh, first inspiration Sarah Emma Edmonds was exposed to. Yeah, the, these, uh, these were very popular stories inspired by and created for the literate, but the lower and working class people, the same class of people who would join the army as privates during the Civil War. And what did these distaff soldiers do? They performed the same duties as men, they carried the same gear, marched the same distances, suffered the same hardships. And how'd they get away with it? Well, to begin with, they came from working class backgrounds, factories, and farms. They were no debutantes from Boston or Philadelphia among the distaff soldiers. Back in the mid 19th century, there are no personal ID or birth certificates. You can move to another city and develop another persona if you wanted to, if you were clever. Greedy recruiters were inquisitive. Ill-fitting army uniforms hid their shapes or they padded them out to hide their shapes. And large numbers of young boys were in the military and the women really blended in. And here's a photo of a young boy from that era. You can see he clearly doesn't shave. The medical exams are cursory and on two occasions we know the women were aided by surgeons whom they knew. Their small statures often solicited aid from their male uh, colleagues. Poor diet, intense activity, and stress curtailed their menstruation. And the condition of the sinks or latrines discovered use, discovered use really by everyone. They all went off by themselves in the woods. Okay. The, uh, the physical exams were easily circumvented not only by women, but also by sickly men and young boys. Recruits needed only decent hearing, two eyes, front teeth, and a trigger finger. Washington tried to enforce the rules, but great pressure for more recruits caused regimental surgeons to ignore them. Some just showed up and joined a regiment directly with the commanding officer. Others fell in with actively campaigning regiments. In some cases, like that of Elizabeth Quinn, also known as Francis Hook, also known as Frank Miller, Company G, 90th Illinois Infantry, who we discussed a little earlier, she was discovered and allowed to remain with her husband as a vivandier. So she would be a civilian woman who would um, uh, give out 
brandy, wine, water to the men on the battlefield during a battle. One story has it that she had previously joined a different company in the same regiment, but had been discovered and dismissed. The captain of that company alerted her current captain to her presence in the regiment. She was actually desirous of serving with her husband, so she went with her husband. Okay, the average soldier north or south was only five feet eight inches tall, weighed about 143, and was 25 years old. Again, easy enough for a woman to blend in. A distaff soldier was discovered in the 6th New York Heavy Artillery. Sergeant Herman Weiss wrote to his wife, it's, it is no wonder at all that her tent mates did not know that she was a woman, for you must know that we never undress to go to bed. On the contrary, we dress up. We go to bed with boots, overcoat, and all on, and she could find chances enough when she could be in the tent all alone to change her clothes. How were they discovered? Distaff soldiers had to be in character 24-7, 365. They could never step out of it. They had to be, they had to talk like men, walk like men, chew tobacco, tell jokes. They had to be in that male character 24-7. If they slipped out of it, they would be caught. There was a case of a uh, distaff soldier sitting under a tree, sheltering from a storm. When a limb broke off and landed next to her, she screamed, that gave her away. She was discovered. Some were recognized by uh, people at home or from home. Uh, hospitalization due to disease and wounding was uh, a really big one, which Sarah M. Edmonds left the Army to avoid. If you went to the hospital uh, as a distaff soldier, you would be discovered giving birth. Another did give away, but it wasn't the physical exams. Uh, in the case of Elizabeth Quinn, her CO challenged her after he had been warned, but in many other cases, it was people from home who would recognize them. What happened after they were discovered? Well, that was inconsistent. Uh, they were discharged, but like Elizabeth Quinn, many just turned around and joined other units. Uh, some were imprisoned, uh, especially in the South. Some were committed. There was one case of a Union unit capturing a distaff Confederate soldier, and for whatever reason, they decided that she was insane and they had her committed. Uh, a couple continued service as uh, civilians. And the South, as I said before, was much more severe than the North. They would put uh, distaff soldiers in Castle Thunder. Now, how do we know about them? Well, uh, a few wrote letters home. A couple, including Sarah M. Edmonds, published their memoirs, which is extremely rare. Uh, and again, like Sarah M. Edmonds, we have military records and pension applications. Newspaper stories, it was well known uh, in the time that women were serving as men. But the stories were often inaccurate. But though it was well known at the time and spoken of and discussed, this slowly disappeared from the public view over the ensuing century and a half. And why that happened, I don't know. It's an interesting phenomenon. And of course, letters and diaries of male soldiers. Here's a letter from a Confederate soldier to his wife after the first battle of Bull Run or first Manassas. There were a great many fanatic women in the Yankee army, some of whom were killed. I was pointed to one of their graves. I knew that I could not be mistaken as to the spot for her foot was sticking out of the ground. So eyewitness accounts. Well, speaking of Bull Run, what dist who, uh, who served there as a distaff soldier? Well, we know about Sarah Emma Evans serving as Frank Thompson with the 2nd Michigan. Louisa Hoffman was for the 1st Ohio Infantry. We don't know what her male persona was. Frances Jameson served as a first lieutenant under her husband, who was a captain. And all we know about Charlie is that she was large, coarse featured, and stubborn, which would not be unusual, I think, for a distaff soldier to be stubborn. Now, those of you who, uh, again, saw my last presentation on Canadians will uh, uh, have to consider this a, uh, a refreshing of Sarah Emma Edmonds. This is for the people who were not around for the last presentation. Uh, she left home at 15 to escape a misogynistic and dominating father who wanted to marry her off to an older man. She eventually found work as a Bible salesman and disguised herself as a man to take it and also to travel safely. She found a better job in Michigan and left Canada. Uh, and when the war broke out, she was in Flint and joined the 2nd Michigan Infantry as Franklin Thompson. And again, as we discussed earlier, she was inspired by the female warrior motif, which was first introduced to her and Fanny Campbell, the female pirate captain, a tale of the revolution. She fought at first Bull Run, then participated in the rest of the Peninsula Campaign under General McClellan as a field nurse, a courier, mail carrier, postmaster, an orderly to the general, General Poe. 
She was injured at least twice in accidents and disguised herself on several occasions to spy behind the Confederate lines. And in crossing the uh, Sickahominy River and Swamp, as both as a, uh, as a mail carrier and as a uh, spy going behind the lines, she contracted malaria. Okay. Um, this caused her to leave the army and eventually killed her in 1898 at the age of 56. She was injured at least twice on accidents. During the Battle of Fair Oaks, her horse Reb bit her and then kicked her. After the battle, General Phil Kearney gave her a Confederate officer's sword in recognition of her conduct as a courier. In return, she gave him Reb while warning him the horse was dangerous. Now remember, he only had one arm. He didn't believe her until the horse kicked him to the ground several times. While carrying mail by mule during the Peninsula campaign, she attempted to cross a ditch. The mule stumbled and fell on her leg, injuring her badly but not breaking her leg. As a result, later in life, she developed severe arthritis in that leg. But because she never went to the hospital, out of fear she would be discovered to be a woman, there are no records or were no records of her injuries. Consequently, though, she eventually received a military pension and she was unable to prove she qualified for medical disability. Significantly, during her military service, she went behind the Confederate lines several times as a spy. This, in addition to being, a, being Canadian, distinguishes Edmonds from other distaffed soldiers. On her first mission, she entered Yorktown disguised as a black slave boy and later went into Williamsburg posing as an Irish woman selling cakes. On another occasion, she again dressed as a civilian and mingled with the residents of Louisville in an attempt to identify those who are Confederate spies or only pro-Confederate civilians. Once, when dressed as a civilian man while re reconnoitering in Lebanon, Kentucky, a Confederate cavalry unit found her and pressed her into Confederate service. Soon afterwards, they came upon a Union cavalry unit. While the Confederate captain was distracted, Edmonds made a dash to the Union soldiers, whose commander somehow recognized her. She later wrote in a memoir that before the Confederate captain could draw his pistol on her, she, quote, emptied the contents of her pistol into his face, end quote. This story is rather fantastic. It isn't clear how she avoided being shot by either the Confederate or Union troops. Edmonds did admit later in life that her memoir consisted of some fabrications and experiences of others. However, Edmonds' biographer, Sylvia Dannett, confirmed much of her story in her book she wrote with the generals, including some of her missions as a spy. Edmonds revised her memoir to reflect her two experiences, but her family lost it after her death. Even with the fabrications, she still did enough, I think, to earn a place in history. We talked about the serious malaria attack that caused her to leave. The army be declared a deserter, but she did eventually come back as a female civilian nurse. As I mentioned, she did earn a pension of $12 a month, which is about $312, $314 today. After the war, she moved to Kansas and then to Texas. Only the only woman to be inducted into the Grand Army of the Republic. She died in 1898 from the malaria. As I said, she contracted during the Peninsula Campaign. And she is buried in Laporte, Texas, initially buried there, then moved to Hollywood Cemetery in Houston with military honors. After the attack of malaria in 1863, and leaving the army to avoid being hospitalized and was discovered to be a woman, she escaped to a boarding house in Oberlin, Ohio, where under her uh, male persona as Frank Thompson, she placed herself in the care of a local doctor. After recovering from the malaria attack, she wanted to return to the army, but found Frank Thompson had been listed as a deserter. She went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where she shed her male persona. We don't know why she went to Pittsburgh, she may have thought it easier to revert, revert to her female persona in a large and impersonal city. She, she then returned as Emma Edmonds to the same boarding house in Oberlin. That must have been an, an interesting experience. She was first there as a man, then as a woman. While there, she wrote her memoir as she continued her convalescence. And in 1864, she joined the U.S. Christian Commission and returned to the Army as a civilian female nurse. When Edmonds wrote her memoir, she wanted to conceal her the duplicity, as she termed it, from her former army comrades. Remember, being a uh, disguising yourself as a man was uh, uh, not a socially acceptable thing to do, and it was illegal. She altered the names or used only initials, sometimes the wrong ones, that did not admit to being a woman. In her memoir, Nurse and Spy in the Union Army, it, uh, it was a bestseller. Profits went to the U.S. Sanitary Commission and charities for wounded soldiers. Disabled soldiers and war widows earned money by selling the book by subscription. By 1884, she was practically debilitated by malaria, which forced her to finally apply for a pension based on her military service. In doing so, 
she finally had to admit masquerading as a man. It took an act of Congress to remove the charge of desertion from her record and clear the way for her pension of $12 a month. Back pay, et cetera, was included. She used the money to open and run a small home for invalid soldiers. Her eventual husband, Linus Seeley, was a Canadian from New Brunswick who came from a Virginia Loyalist family, so his grandparents were Americans. Edmonds met him in Harpers Ferry in 1864 when she was a civilian nurse. After, a war, after the war, she returned to Oberlin College in Ohio for a short time. In her memoir, Edmund stated that she was motivated by patriotism for the US, her adopted country. She remembered the war as a time for entire self-sacrifice, entire self-forgetfulness and subordination to preserving the union. But based on what we know about her personality, she was undoubtedly also seeking adventure, which she certainly got in spades. But who else was a distaff soldier on the Confederate side? Well, there was Loretta Velasquez, AKA Lieutenant Harry Buford. There is a, uh, a Netflix documentary about her. She was a Roman Catholic and Cuban. She was inspired by Joan of Arc. She was educated by Roman Catholic sisters. She was fought at first Bull Run, Balls Bluff, Virginia, and then Fort Donaldson in Tennessee. She was discovered to be a woman in New Orleans and discharged. She was not sent to Castle Thunder. She then re-enlisted and fought at Shiloh. She, again, she just turned around and joined a different, uh, different unit. She was discovered again. After that, she became a Confederate spy and using both male and female disguises. Then she became a double agent for the Union and was hired to search for herself, which is good work if you can get it. Not surprisingly, when she died in 1923, it was in a psychiatric hospital. That is not a surprise. Okay, now let's play a little bit of a game. Um, I explained how sometimes because of the size uh, of the soldiers and their parents and uh, many young boys joining the army, it was easier for a woman to blend in. So I have a series of photographs and I'll ask you to see if you can determine if the photo is of a man or of a woman. This is the first one. I'll give you a minute to look at it. Make up your mind. Not really a minute because Mike would get upset with me. This is Catherine Lewis, second Minnesota volunteers. Good likeness of a man. And who is this? Interesting face, man or woman? This is a man, Josiah Mahoney, Company D, 8th Tennessee Cavalry. And we have another one. Is this a man or a woman? Sarah Rosetta Wakeman, AKA Private Lyons. Wakeman, Company H of the 153rd New York Volunteer Infantry. Wakeman uh, received a bounty of $152 when she joined as a distaff soldier. Then she received $13 a month, which she used to provide for her family at home. She died at the age of 21 of chronic diarrhea in 1864 at a military hospital in New Orleans. The hospital did not reveal her gender and she was buried as Private Lyons Wakeman with military honors. We have uh, a couple more to go. Man or woman? This is Jenny Hodgers, born in Ireland in 1843 and served as Alpha Cashier of the, with the 95th Illinois Infantry. And Jenny, AKA Albert, is the person I mentioned earlier who remained in her male persona after the war. Hodges maintained her male persona for 53 years. He was the only distaff soldier we know of who had to do so. In 1911, Cashier, who was working for State Senator Ira Lish, was hit by the senator's car, presumably driven by the senator, resulting in a broken leg. A physician at the hospital discovered her secret, but he did not disclose it. No longer able to work, Cashier was moved to the Soldiers and Sailors Home in Quincy, Illinois, on May 5th, 1911, where she was visited by many friends and fellow soldiers from the 95th. Cashier lived there until an obvious deterioration of the mind began to take place and she was moved to the Watertown State Hospital for the insane in March of 1914. Attendants there discovered her sex and at which point she was made to wear a woman's clothes after what we assume would be more than 50 years wearing men's attire. It's not a surprise that she seems tripped over her dress. She broke her hip and she died shortly thereafter. And that is a shame. 
Now, why did she remain in her male persona? We can't ask her, we don't know. But again, uh, women in that era um, were able to have a better life as a man. One more photo. Who is the person in the middle? Is that a male or is that a female, man or woman? In fact, it is unknown. We don't know. And that's my presentation. And this is my book, Soldier Girl Blue. It's available on Amazon.com. And there are links to it on my website, jjnights.com. Thank you very much for watching and listening. And thank you, Mike. We're all finished.